Um, so we, I've had, I've had the pleasure of hearing several um, stories, um, which is the one story which kind of you, you kind of regularly dine out on. Was there one that? Well, I do like to talk uh, about the one uh, around the CERN of the ocean. Yeah. I thought I, I, I think that was uh, that was a, a, a good one. Uh, I've got a few others, um, but I, I, I probably um, uh, I shouldn't repeat them. <laughs> <laughs> I might write them down one day, but uh, uh, I've um, yeah, I I. Can you talk about the um, boating at boat face and how oh. our autos became boating at boat face? Yes. Well, of course. Um, yes, that was that was an interesting uh, uh, story. I was, um, as you know, NERC had this idea to um, uh, let the public uh, choose the name of the new polar research vessel. In fact. I was with the uh, then NERC chief executive, Duncan Wingham, uh, in his office. We'd just uh, uh, had a one-to-one had -one meeting and it had finished and some people came in and um, they were communications people and they said, well, we've had a great idea. Uh, why don't we let the, the uh, public have a say in this uh, new uh, uh, ship? And I remember his words, his exact words to this day. He said, well, make sure uh, you give them a limited list of names because otherwise it's going to end up with some stupid name like Snoop Dogg. Um, they they went off to the uh, to bays and civil servants there. They thought it was a great idea, and the science minister's office thought it was a great idea. Um, but somewhere in the process, the idea of ha having a limited list got dropped this was going to be a completely open vote and of course we all know what happened next the great british public um, in their wisdom and their, their sense of humor uh, chose the name boaty mcboatface which was you know way in a ahead of any other other names of illustrious individuals who it might be named after like <laughs> david attenborough and uh, this was all happening at the, at the time of the brexit vote as well so there was a there was a sort of a serious political dimension to this because this was never meant to be a vote either. It was these these were suggestions, but of course this was all lost on the in translation. So if if the will of the people in terms of the naming of this vessel was going to be discarded, then what was going to happen in this Brexit vote? So so. So this this was a serious issue. Um, clearly, they weren't going to call the new polar vessel uh, boat him a boat face, and um, it was duly given a name, which of course nobody could disagree with, uh, Sir David Attenborough. But it was decided that the name boat him a boat face um, would have to live on. And one idea was to name one of the lifeboats uh, boat him a boat face. But the Maritime and Coast Guard agency was absolutely having none of that. Because you can't have a lifeboat, you know, of a ship that's sunk floating around with the name boating. But you need to know what, what the name of the ship is that it's come from. So they, they were having none of that. Um, and so eventually I got a call at uh, six o'clock one evening saying, well, the science ministers decide the name will live on and it will be a um, uh, one of these uh, submersibles. Um, Realising that not was the only place with any... <laughs> submersibles at all autonomous uh, underwater vehicles it was quite quite clear it was um it was going to come from us and um and could could in the next half an hour uh, they have a photograph <laughs> of which one it was so uh, so that's that's how it how it came i was quite cross at the time um because uh, i thought well if it's not good enough for the the new polar vessel why should uh, the name be attached, you know, a joke name be attached to something that, you know, we've put 25 years of uh, more of effort into, it's a serious business observing the ocean. Um, and I did uh, uh, complain quite bitterly to NERC about this and uh, I, I received an unsympathetic response, shall we say. But um, it, uh, eventually I could see that it got publicity value. It was opening doors that we could never, never, never get to. That's um, probably a great uh, and so it is a great, great engagement tool. So, so I got, I got over my initial uh, uh, 
uh, annoyance at, at this. But um, but uh, yeah, that's a, that was a good story. So time for another picture, Ed. Um, hand this one to you with the Prince Philip. Ah, oh, yes. Yes, this was uh, the naming of the National Oceanography Centre Southampton, as it was then known in uh, 2005. Um, I'd come uh, with uh, a vision, really, to um, create a National Oceanography Centre, which I always claimed was not my vision. Um, it was the original uh, vision, which went right back to 1989, when uh, Council uh, approved the uh, creation of a large uh, oceanographic institution, which would involve bringing together um, various uh, activities like the Research Vessel Base, the Institute of Oceanographic Sciences based in, in Wormley, uh, along with um, departments from the University of Southampton and some smaller institutes into a, a, a large uh, centre. Uh, and it was described um, uh, back in 1989, and uh, it was uh, John Woods, who was then the uh, NERC Director of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences, who really promoted this uh, uh, vision very hard, that this should be the national focus for oceanography uh, in the UK. Um, yet it, it, it hadn't uh, fully realised uh, that potential. It became, uh, it was formed as the, uh, originally the name was going to be the Southampton uh, Centre for Deep Sea Oceanography. So very uh, specific remit. Then it became the Southampton Oceanography Centre, um, but um, it was it was clear um, that it wasn't quite uh, moving in the direction that it that had hoped either from the University of Southampton's perspective or from 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 NERC's. and uh, and so I. Uh, came in 2005, in fact it was 2004 when I was uh, appointed, and I said, well, why don't we put the name on the tin and uh, actually call this centre uh, what it was always intended to be, which is the National Oceanography Centre. Uh, and uh, so that's what we did. There was some um, uh, disquiet about that. There were, you know, was that the right name for the centre? Um, the university were concerned that the name Southampton would be lost. Um, uh, so there was a classic compromise of calling it the National Oceanography Centre, comma, uh, uh, Southampton. But uh, I said, give me the word national and uh, we can build what the centre really uh, was always intended uh, to be. And... Uh, and that's that's what we what we did, and I remember saying to staff at the time, we're we're not actually yet the National Oceanography Centre. We've got the name. What we have to do now is earn the name uh, to start behaving as one and start to to function uh, in that that mould. And and that's what we. Uh, started to do. So the beginning of this, for, for me, the, 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 the name was crucial and I always used to say, you know, the vision is in the name. Yeah. Uh, that That's what we're trying to uh, achieve here. The um, uh, Royal Academy of Engineering was uh, hosting a, a, a summer um, soiree uh, event, a uh, big black tie uh, event here at Southampton. There was a, a marquee out on the quayside, and um, uh, uh, a lot of uh, people were coming, including um, the uh, uh, senior president of the uh, of the of the Royal Academy of Engineering, which is the Duke of Edinburgh. And so I thought this was an opportunity um, uh, because he had uh, originally come to name. Uh, the building, the Southampton Oceanography Centre, the centre uh, uh, when it was opened in 1994-1995. And so I thought, who, who more appropriate to, to do this than him? And so uh, it was a bit naughty, I suppose, but I managed to hijack <laughs> him for uh, 
uh, part of that visit and he agreed to, to do it and uh, and uh, I made a short speech uh, uh, explaining why uh, we were calling it this which was to um, uh, bring about and make a reality of this vision mm. of a true national focus for oceanography in the UK and he duly uh, unveiled the, the plaque and uh, and that was it yeah. um, there was no turning back from the name at that point of view, and you know, we knew we had that in the bag. And as I said, the name um, reflected the ambition of what uh, I was hoping we could we could achieve. Yeah. And uh, stroke of genius, giving that your seal of, seal of approval as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I've uh, I, I I thought that uh, it would there would be no going back yeah. from from yeah. that. So and, uh, and, um, Philip's got a Prince Philip's got a, a character. I mean, he, he, any stories? Oh uh, yes, he he, he is uh, he is quite a, quite a character. Uh, we gave him a little uh, a little uh, token of appreciation for mm -hmm. doing, which was a you know a colour coffee table uh, uh, book, uh, which was open to a, a suitable page, and it uh, showed some tropical fish, and uh, he made the sort of a mark. Well, well, are there any fish left in the sea? And uh, um, but he, um, he 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 was he was very he was very good. And of course, we've had a number of uh, royal uh, visits uh, since, and the Princess Royal has named both of the mm. royal research vessels. Uh, James Cook, she came in uh, in 2007, and then she came back in 2013 for the naming of of, of the of the discovery. Um, so, so yeah. So uh, I've got, I guess you know you've met the royal family, um, you know, heads of state, uh, leading top ag academics. Um, and you know, indeed, leaders of industry. Thinking back, is there one person that, that really kind of stands out as, as being inspirational? Um, well, that's quite uh, quite a difficult uh, mm. uh, uh, question, really. Um, but I can uh, trace some people who've had an in influence on on, on me, um, and who've, who've 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 impressed me. Um, one of which was uh, not the first, but the second chief executive of NERC that I, I worked for. Uh, the, the first one who appointed me was uh, Sir John Krebs. Uh, but uh, he qu quickly handed over to Sir John Lawton, uh, who was uh, a, a really quite an inspirational um, figure. He, he actually came in with a with a reputation of disliking marine science um, and he didn't much like uh, research institutes either. Um, by the time uh, he had finished his term um, he had completely changed on both scores. He was, he was very positive about marine science. Indeed he was the one who really drove the funding uh, behind what is now the, the rapid uh, program and made sure that that uh, that happened. Um, he 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 uh, had been to meetings in in Norway and the U.S. and was persuaded to to, to put the money behind that. So he he he, he did that. Um, and uh, I I ended up getting on uh, very well with him. Um, but I remember my first meeting with him when he was appointed as chief executive and he sat me down in uh, his his room and he says it works like this Ed um, I expect my directors to direct he said if you uh, mess up come and tell me I won't blame you I just need to know uh, if you mess up repeatedly I might begin to question your judgment and that was that was the only instruction I ever got from him uh, about anything. But I found that truly sort of uh, empowering. Yeah. And I took him at his word. Um, and uh, I did quite a lot of tough things uh, uh, during that period. I was at the uh, Proudman Lab and we were relocating it to the University of Liverpool uh, campus. And, um, you know, there was a lot of discontent about that. It was a, a big upheaval. Um, but I, 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 I knew that... Uh, I, I, I had uh, I had his support, so he, that 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 was a, a fine example of, um, mm. of of somebody who really really I found quite quite inspiring, and uh, he uh, he was one of life's 
great enthusiast. Whenever he came into, uh, uh, he, he loved talking about science, and you know everybody um, just felt a lot better when he left the room than they did when he walk, walked in. And that, that's not always been the case for 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 all people that you encounter. But people who can do that um, are a rare a rare talent. Um, I've met a number of uh, political leaders and. Uh, uh, you know, most science ministers have been to to NOC, and uh, we've had a lot of uh, ministers uh, visit here. Um, I would have to say there are only two ministers that have really stuck in my mind as being uh, exceptional and sort of had something about them and some character, um, and they were at opposite ends of the political spectrum. Um, one was John Prescott, who was then Deputy Prime Minister, sort of uh, old Labour, uh, uh, you know, trade unionists and, and so forth. Um, and the other one was Boris Johnson. Um, and both of them uh, are not everyone's uh, cup of tea necessarily. Um, but I found both of those um, um, actually very interested um, and able to interact and communicate um, in without the the blandness, should we say, that is typical of typical of of, of many. Yeah. yeah, I remember um, when John Prescott visited. Um, uh, there, there was a little entourage of people with him and business leaders, and um, of course uh, Prescott had been a steward on uh, on a, a liners. Um, uh, and uh, he was uh, in the Siemens Union and, and so forth. And somebody said to him, rather foolishly, I thought, um, uh, Mr. Prescott, have you ever visited Southampton before? <laughs> and he said, oh, yes, many times. He said, um, hey, you know that little uh, patch of grass there outside Dock Gate 4? Oh, yes, yes, yes. yes. That's where we used to organise all our strikes. So... Uh, he was he was good. He he came down. He was particularly particularly interested in the um, the, the the deep remotely operated vehicle um, that that we have here, and he'd been instrumental actually in uh, securing the funding from government uh, for it. Um, uh, he had a particular interest in uh, trying to see if uh, um, one could understand what had happened to the sinking of the fishing trawler, the uh, the Gaul, which had disappeared in. In mysterious circumstances and very concerned about the, the loss of life um, he, he, he basically wanted the UK to have a capability to, to, to make these uh, uh, deep sea uh, observations and that was where his interests came from he, I think he was transport minister at the time um, but yes yeah and uh, Johnson was uh, was interesting as as well um, uh, he he did take a big interest in environmental issues, and uh, he he came to to visit his here in in Knock. Um, but he also um, came to the Ocean Pavilion in in COP twenty seven in Egypt, and uh, he uh, um, uh, again um, was 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 very interested and very astute. I mean, he, he on on both occasions. I mean, he was. Um, playing to the cameras and um, playing his uh, studied uh, buffoonery. Um, but he was, he did ask some very penetrating and sharp questions. Uh, he was he clearly has, had, had great ability, but you know, um, opposite ends of the political spectrum, but um, both, large both large characters and both very memorable, memorable. So thinking back after, you know, along your, um, long successful career is there one thing that you would want to be known for well I, I, I suppose the obvious answer to that is that you know it's for others others to judge mm -hmm. ultimately um one one does one's best and it's been a huge uh, privilege to 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 lead the organization and, and play a, a, a role in the evolution of marine science in the uk uh, but ultimately, others will will judge. But the the thing uh, probably is the creation of the National Oceanography Centre um, um, to be more than the name to to 
to genuinely um, be the national focus for ocean science in, in the UK, and especially big global scale ocean science. Um, from time to time, uh, chief executives would sort of start asking about, or well, do we really need all these institutes? And I would simply say, you know, there's no serious country on the planet who's um, trying to do oceanography uh, at scale that is attempting to do this through their university sector alone. I mean, there's a huge number of bright academics and capabilities across the 30 or more universities in the UK that do ocean science. That's not in doubt, there are some brilliant people. But you also need uh, infrastructure, you need the long-term capability, you need to be, have the critical mass of technical capability um, that universities find particularly uh, hard uh, to, to maintain. You need to be able to uh, maintain those pieces of equipment like deep remotely operated vehicles that the, the UK can only afford one of. Um, and those areas of science that would struggle on their own uh, um, to survive in the university sector. I, I used to say that uh, in Britain you could get all the sort of principal investigator level physical oceanographers and fit them on a double-decker bus. Uh, uh, and uh, the, 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 the lower floor would be knock uh, and the upper floor would be scattered across a very large number of universities in numbers of, you know, no more than two or three. Um, and so that, that's an example of a discipline that, that needs a, sort of a critical mass of capability. And there are others as well. Um, to be able to get that longevity of vision, to do the support for the sustained observing systems, which go beyond um, the lifetime of a three-year research grant or of the or, or of activities where they cannot just be dependent on the principal investigator. In other words, when those people leave, um, that's the end mm. of that particular activity. There's a longevity and that's, that's needed. And so those are, you know, many of the ingredients of a, of a, of a national centre. And what I've always believed, crucially, is that, you know, the, the word nationally not means something. It means it's um, somehow enabling the whole of the UK's national science community to make it stronger together than it would be uh, without the existence of NOC. And that's how, how you tell uh, that you've got something. And, and the countries that do this successfully are able to make their national institution and their academic sector work together to be mutually supportive, mutually valued, and you get the full power of your, of your science community out. And that's, that's what I think you need. Actually, I think many countries don't do this very well um, and I think Britain does it particularly well and I, 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 I believe that the National Ocean Office Centre has got something to do with that. So I'm, I'm proud to have had a part in bringing that to into existence as I've said on many occasions that wasn't my vision I'd claim no originality in the vision but I like to think that I had a role in actually making it happen and turning it from an idea yeah. into something that, up the that is, is, to, is today. Uh, because it could so easily have lost its way and not, not it could have turned into something else, which I didn't think was, was right. But, uh, and so I'm, I'm pleased that that's where it is. And uh, was not becoming an independent uh, institution ever part of the plan? Was, that, was, that, was it just, again, another opportunity? Uh, I always thought that um, something would happen along those lines. To be perfectly honest, I didn't think it would happen in my term. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the centre's been through three gestations. It was essentially something that was um, probably on a course to become a department, a school of the University of Southampton. 
Um, it then moved into NERC to become a wholly owned NERC, NERC Institute and then became uh, an independent self-governing uh, organisation. So that's three uh, uh, gestations and I didn't think that that last one would happen in my, my time. But the opportunity for it to happen came quite quickly after we moved into NERC. Um, it had been talked about for some time, um, but NERC had never really got any interest in doing it. And then a chief executive came along who actually did uh, or wanted want to do it. So, um, and then of course it took an absolutely uh, inordinate amount of time to make it happen. You know, over six six years. Um, so um, it, that uh, so it's all, it's all part of the. The, the journey and the important part of, of that for, for Knox uh, formation was it gave it the independence, uh, the freedom and the flexibility uh, to be able to uh, develop in a way that had become increasingly difficult inside uh, the government yeah. system, you know, to be able to hire top talent across the world, to be able to uh, generate surplus revenue that we could feed back into our own science, taking our own risks, um, investing in promising new areas of science and technology, all of those things. Uh, originally, uh, as NERC Institutes, those flexibilities existed. And so I would have been quite content uh, for it to have stayed as, an, as, a, as a NERC Institute and thought that that's probably what would happen for a very long time. Um, um, but that whole system gummed up, particularly after the financial crisis in 2008, and those freedoms um, very quickly were, were, were removed, and it became quite clear that it was in, incompatible with attempting to run a world-class scientific organisation. So, um, so all that uh, all that happened quite 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 quickly.